Now we're going to uh, be looking tonight and next week, God willing, at the second chapter of First Thessalonians. And so tonight what I want to do is to read with you the verses that we'll be considering, which are the first 12 verses of the chapter. 1 Thessalonians 2, and reading please at verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For you remember, brethren, our labour and travail, for labouring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses and God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now the Lord have blessed us the reading of his word. Now, what I want to do is just make some general introductory comments to the chapter, and then to go down it verse by verse, briefly on each verse necessarily, and to put a word over each of the verses that we have read together, which will summarize what's in the verse, and together we'll weave a picture, which I trust will be memorable, of what we're thinking about in the passage, and that we might be able to take it away, and it be of real benefit and help to us. Uh, we've read what I think is the first division of the chapter, and the chapter in fact divides into two. So in the verses that we've read, you will have noticed, I'm sure, that Paul is remembering the time that he had with these people in the city of Thessalonica. He's remembering his time with them. Next week, God willing, we'll see this, that now that he had left them and had gone on to Berea, to Athens, to Corinth, in all likelihood. Now that he has left them, he is recounting to them his thankfulness for them and his desire for them. So in, in brief, 1 to 12, he remembers the time at Thessalonica. And then from 13 to the end of the chapter, he's recording for them his thanksgiving for them and his desires for them now that he was away from them and how he longed to see them again. Now the first thing about the section that we read together that is really important to notice is this, that in service for the Lord, uh, Paul had a single eye for the glory of God. Look at what he says, will you, in verse 4. He says, we speak not as pleasing men, but God. So as he's relating to them the 
fact that he preached the gospel unto them, he's reminding them that he did so not to please them or to please any other men, but in fact, in doing so, he was preaching to please God. And then look further down the chapter at the last verse that we read, verse 12. And what you see is that the whole aim of the apostles' ministry in the city uh, was that these people who heard the gospel and believed and followed on so well, that these people would in fact walk worthily of God. His great ambition uh, was not that he might have numbers to count of the people who had professed to be saved, but that each of those who had professed faith in Christ and salvation would behave, would live, would walk in such a manner as befits God himself. Now, with that in mind, can, can you just notice, uh, before we get into some of the details, can you just notice that there is repeated reference to God in the verses that we read together? So if you look at verse 2, it speaks about the fact that he was bold in our God. He was bold in our God, he says, as he spoke the gospel of God. Then look at verse 4. He was allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. And as he made it known, as we've seen, verse 4 tells us that he didn't do this as pleasing men, but as pleasing God. And you'll notice again in verse 4 that he's indicating that it is God which trieth our hearts. In verse 5, God is his witness. And all of this ultimately, as we've seen in verse 12, was that these believers might walk worthily of God. So it seems to me like this that everything about his service, everything he said, Every part of his conduct was done in view of the fact that it was to, towards God and for the glory of God and for the honour of his name. And of all the things that we're going to pick up tonight on the way through the passage, that's the thing I would like us most to remember. That in service, it should all be for the glory of God. Whatever it is that we do, we're connected to God, we speak on his behalf, we act on his behalf, and not only so, but surely the great desire of every believer in helping other believers is that in actual fact we might uh, assist them in enabling them to walk worthily of God. And if the question is asked why does Paul speak like he does in these verses, it is likely that he speaks in the manner that he is speaking to counter uh, opposition uh, that uh, was engendered in Thessalonica to the work that he had accomplished. You might remember that when he was in Thessalonica in Acts 17, uh, there were those who were really charging him with sedition because their great complaint was that he preached another king, uh, even Jesus. And likely now Paul had left the city uh, that opposition and the twisting of his words was continuing and it seems to me best to understand this passage that we've read together in the light of there being those who oppose the work that he accomplished for God in the city. Now there's just uh, another thing that I want you to notice uh, before we hit the verses one by one and as I say in brief, the first is this, that in the first five verses that we read together, the emphasis is on speech, what was said. And so look at verse two. He says there, we were bold in our God to speak unto you. Verse three, our exhortation. Verse four, we speak. Verse five, he relates to his words, which were not flattering words and as he's speaking in these terms about what he spoke to them about the word that we might notice is this that he had boldness that's in verses one to five then in six to nine there's an emphasis now on 
souls. And this that he was willing to impart unto them, not only the gospel, but he says in verse 8, but also our own souls. And the idea in this is that he didn't want to be a burden to the believers in Thessalonica in any way. And so he acted accordingly, as we shall see. Then in verses 10 to 12, the great emphasis is on support. And uh, the support that he gave to them, as we'll see, as a father to his sons, his children. And uh, obviously in that section, he's speaking about their behavior while he was there in the city. Uh, if you look at verse 8, you'll notice this, that he says, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. And those two expressions, imparting the gospel and imparting our own souls, nicely divide our passage. In the first six verses, the idea is this, that he was willing to have imparted unto them the gospel. Whereas in uh, 7 to 12, we read how that they imparted unto these Thessalonian believers, he says, our own souls. Now, what I want to do in the balance of the time, and we're finishing about quarter past eight, don't hold me to that precisely to the second, but we're aiming to finish at quarter past eight. Uh, I want to go verse by verse through, and over verse one, to begin with, I want to put the word effectiveness. And the idea behind that is simply this, that their entrance was not in vain. Uh, when it speaks, of course, about their entrance, uh, the idea is not just uh, their turning up in Thessalonica and the first day they were there, but it's really got in mind the whole of the time that they were there in the city. And he's um, looking back on the ministry that they engaged in and the results that he knew. And he says, you yourselves, yourselves know, brethren, our entrance unto you that it was not in vain, it was effective. Now last week, uh, in chapter one, verse four, and those next verses, uh, Paul makes it clear that he and Silas and Timotheus, who were concerned in writing this letter, they knew that their entrance was not in vain because they've seen a mighty work of grace in the lives of these uh, of these Thessalonian people and in wonderful ways the apostle describes how that they had known the life-changing power of the gospel in the city of Thessalonica uh, so they knew when you come to chapter 1 verse 9 the Macedonians and the Achaeans they knew in fact, that uh, Paul's entering in to Thessalonica was not in vain because uh, of what he says in verse 8. Uh, From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith to God would have spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. So their faith had spread right the way through the regions of uh, Macedonia and Achaia, so that they'd gone right the way down through modern Greece, that, that territory. And so those people knew that Paul's entrance into Thessalonica was not in vain. And now he's reminding them that they themselves know that his entrance in unto them was not in vain. And of course, it wasn't in vain because verse two, he was able to speak uh, unto you, he says, the gospel of God. It wasn't in vain because verse eight, he says, he was able to impart unto them the gospel of God. And in verse 9, he was able to preach unto them the gospel of God. And not only that, but they received it as the word of God, verse 13 says, which we'll be considering together next week. So the point about all of that is this, that Paul's entrance in unto them was not in vain. It was purposeful. It was effective. There were outcomes. Over verse 2, I want to put the word boldness. Effectiveness in verse 1, because there was a permanent result from his ministry. Over verse 2, I've put the word boldness, uh, which isn't particularly original or difficult, 
because he says we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Now, a wonderful thing is occurring here because you may remember that in Acts 16, he was at Philippi. And we all know the story of the Philippian jailer and the difficulties that Paul had, the many stripes that he had on his back in Philippi, the difficulties, the persecution, the imprisonment that he knew, uh, Acts 16. But now in Acts 17, when he went to Thessalonica, uh, we discover that the sufferings at Philippi didn't in any way impede the ministry in which he was engaged in Thessalonica. He didn't deter him in the preaching. So in this verse, I want you to notice, please, two expressions. And the first of them is this, uh, bold in our God. So here comes Paul to Thessalonica after the difficulties in Philippi in Acts 16. And he didn't come as it were, with his tail between his legs. He didn't come all apologetic. Uh, he didn't come looking to do a minimum amount. But when Paul reached Thessalonica, he was bold in God. And notice what he says. We were bold in our God. So the idea here is simply this, that what uh, Paul had in Thessalonica was not fleshly courage, any more than he used fleshly means or fleshly methods, but recognizing that God was our God, the God who he knew, the God of heaven in all his wonderful character, in all his great power. Th these men who were preaching, they knew him, he says, to be our God, and we were bold in our God. They recognized the greatness of God and were able to be bold to speak freely as a result of that. Now, even though he bore the marks of suffering at Philippi, and he came to Thessalonica perhaps battered and bruised and bloodied, but he preached in Thessalonica unbowed, and as we're seeing here, with boldness and he did that uh, even though as he preached the gospel it was in contention there were difficulties all around you saw last week in chapter 1 verse 6 they received the word in much affliction here he is preaching in contention there were difficulties surrounding the communication of the message but notwithstanding all of that he was bold in God, in his God, in their God. We were bold in our God. I suppose that's a very challenging thing <clears throat> to each of us because it's ever so easy to be put off, isn't it, in our testimony? And instead of being bold, to be very withheld and drawn back. Well, says Paul, we were bold in our God. And second expression I want you to notice in verse two is this, that he's speaking uh, in Thessalonica, of course, the gospel of God. So it's proper to be bold in the preaching of the gospel because the gospel of God, it, well, it's his message. We've noted an emphasis in the chapter already on the gospel of God. Verse 2, verse 8, verse 9, the expression occurs. The gospel of God. And uh, in that it's of God, we know who is its source. He's the living and true God. And we remember that the gospel comes from him. And the message of the gospel is that which leads to him, leads men and women to God himself. And remember, too, that the gospel of God has God as its subject matter. The gospel is not about man. Man likes to think about man. Because man glories in man. But when we have the gospel, we rejoice in glory in God. And what we're delighted in, in the gospel of God, is that it is his, it comes from him, as I say, and it leads to him. Elsewhere, Paul will call it, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the testimony of God. Uh, perhaps the enemies at Thessalonica 
uh, were saying that if it really was of God, how come Paul had to leave Thessalonica in post haste as he did because of the persecution? But in that we're reminded it's the gospel of God. We remember that it has veracity. It is truth. It has reliability. The gospel of God is trustworthy because it's of God. And not only that, but it is authoritative. It has authority because it is God's glorious message. And so the apostle is speaking about boldness. Now, the next thing in verse three is he speaks about openness. And he says that he's preaching, that is the, 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 the exhortation, is the, 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 the word exhortation he uses uh, for the various means by which he communicated the message uh, in Thessalonica and then help the believers. Uh, he's saying that in the making known of the message of the gospel, we had uh, openness. Uh, so it wasn't characterized by deceit, nor uncleanness, nor guile. Uh, the suggestion is this, that it wasn't characterized, it wasn't of deceit as to its source. In other words, the message didn't arise from error. It didn't arise from delusion. <clears throat> the message, <coughs> excuse me, doesn't arise from misapprehension. And Paul was not a victim of deceit in coming to Thessalonica with the message. So it wasn't of deceit. And of course, elsewhere, he's going to tell us that we shouldn't handle it deceitfully. A lot of brothers and sisters, there should be an openness <coughs> about our handling of the gospel, of our making it known. This is something that should be, uh, we should be like an open book in the manner in which we deal with truth. Uh, so he says it's not of deceit as to its source. It's not of uncleanness as to the motive that they had in making the message known. They had no mixed motive. We'll put it like this. They weren't there for monetary gain. And they weren't there for personal honor or reputation. <clears throat> as well, of course, as this, there was no moral impurity amongst them as they labored for the Lord in the city of Thessalonica. So there was of, not of deceit, as to its source, not of uncleanness as to their motives, not in guile as to their method. So there's no trickery involved. Uh, they weren't uh, like the fishermen using a bait on a hook to fool the fish and catch the fish. Uh, this of course has no place amongst the Lord's people <clears throat> and certainly has no place in the communication of the gospel. The apostle says, not in guile, we didn't use a bait, so to speak, as it is that we made the gospel known, but everything was above board and an open book. He said we were there with openness. Now, when you come to verse four, the uh, word I want us to think about is the word faithfulness. And in this verse, as he speaks about faithfulness, uh, what he's saying is this, that he had the gospel as a sacred trust from God. So he speaks of himself here in a sense as a trustee. And as a trustee, of course, his great interest should be that uh, the beneficiaries of that trust. You know, elsewhere, he calls himself a steward. The responsibility of a steward is to the master. The responsibility of a trustee is to carry out the wishes of the person who's, as it were, given that trust for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And so what Paul is saying in verse four is this, <clears throat> that he was put in trust with the gospel. I wonder if we treat the gospel as a sacred trust, which God has given to us, perhaps in a special way to Paul, but nevertheless, he's given it to us as his people, the gospel as a sacred trust. And when he communicated the gospel, he recognized that that's what it was, which is why uh, he did not speak, as we were thinking in the last verse, of deceit or uncleanness or in guile. But what we discover here 
contrary wise in verse 4 is this that he spoke not as pleasing men uh, but God and he recognized that because this was a sacred trust he was answerable to God and God tries our hearts to prove us so as to approve us now, brothers and sisters how important it is that whatever we're doing in God's service whatever it is that we're doing whether it's preaching or teaching or whether it is exhorting passing on personal testimony witnessing for the Lord whatever it is uh, let us have in mind this that we should really have a single eye to the glory of God and that absolutely everything is secondary to pleasing him it's often said isn't it that at the judgment seat the commendation is not well done good and successful servant but the commendation will be well done good and faithful servant and Paul had this in mind as he was making the gospel known now the, the word I want to put over verse 5 is the word witness and of course it's in this verse that we discover that Paul uh, is able to say that God is witness this is something that he appeals to in various places in the New Testament how that <clears throat> everything that he did was before the eye of God and he recognized it that God witnessed everything and so in this verse he speaks of that fact that all was before the sight of God uh, is this a direct response to what the enemies might have been saying in Thessalonica in order that he might solemnly say to these Thessalonians that the motives he had were pure his conduct was of character Christian character that in actual fact he moved in the light of the fact that God was the witness of all that he said and all that he did and if that's what the response uh, what the enemies were saying then the answer to what they were saying is is just this they only sought to please God and because of that he says we did not use flattering words that is words which flatterers use you come across a flatterer sometimes don't you and you have a conversation you come away not believing a word they've told you uh, well here here is Paul saying you know when we were there we the gospel doesn't need flattering words in fact we didn't use flattering words uh, these are words which not only are an effort to please the hearer but there's always motives of self-interest that come along with flattery when he says we didn't use flattering words and we didn't use a cloak of covetousness a cloak for covetousness would be the idea and this expression is interesting it kind of signifies the assuming of something as a disguise for the real motive covering up the real motive so he says he did not use flattering words to gain or take advantage he didn't use flattering words as a cloak of covetousness is likely the idea in the verse he didn't use flattering words in order to gain from his hearers any advantage to himself any personal profit he was careful in the way that he did this in the way that he acted because God is his witness now, the next thing I want you to notice is this that as he's ministering at Thessalonica, as he's remembering that ministry, he's also now uh, going to speak in a way that causes us to realize the lowliness of the man and indeed his meekness. So the pure motives that Paul and Silas and whoever had when they were preaching in that city uh, are further seen now in verse 6 when he says this uh, that there was no seeking of glory uh, there was no seeking of glory from men generally he says you see that not of men nor of men sought with glory neither of you he says to the Thessalonians nor yet of 
others. I wonder what this might mean. Nor of men sought we glory, nor of you, nor yet of others. And the suggestion is, and it seems to uh, resonate with me at least, the suggestion is that uh, the glory here is probably a reference to material things. Uh, as Paul moves on from this verse, he's going to uh, make it clear that uh, he wasn't there in Thessalonica in order that he might gain material advantage. Indeed, there was huge sacrifice that he was involved in, in the spread of the gospel and in ministering amongst them who believed in that city. Uh, and of course, in, in that they didn't seek any remuneration. They didn't seek any material gain from the Thessalonians. They were denying to themselves a right that they possessed. That is, a right to be maintained by those to whom these apostles ministered. 1 Corinthians 9 is a passage that particularly deals with that. So what we're saying here is this, that our ministry in Thessalonica wasn't spoiled by money. Money has its place. Money that's desired, money that is coveted after, becomes filthy lucre in biblical terms. So it's absolutely vital that in service for the Lord, in whatever capacity we're involved in it, that we should not be involved uh, with a desire for enrichment. Neither, by the way, should it be that in the Lord's work that funding is ever requested. Money diminishes everything when it's not in its proper place. In actual fact, when Paul was here in the city, the Philippians sent twice to meet his needs. Uh, they were very generous, even out of their deep poverty. They ministered to the Apostle Paul twice when he was in the city of Thessalonica, as Philippians chapter 4 makes clear. So that the result of that is this, that they were not burdensome to the Thessalonians. You see that in verse 6 when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, he says we didn't seek glory either from you or, for that matter, from anyone else. So in those verses, he's speaking about the impartation of the gospel. Now move on into the next section, and he's speaking about the impartation of their own souls. And over verse 7, uh, I want to put the word gentleness. In actual fact, the Bible itself puts the word gentleness at least it says this, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. And so gentleness. And here is the metaphor, of course, of a nursing mother. Later down the chapter, the metaphor of a father. Here's the metaphor of a nursing mother with her own children. She is gentle. Uh, I hope all mothers who are listening tonight uh, managed to retain that gentleness during the schools being off. Not too fractious, I hope. Remember when your children were born. Remember how you nourished them and cherished them, held them so gently, cuddled them, gave them warmth. As I Paul, we were gentle among you as a nursing mother with her own children. Everything was tenderness. Everything was devotion. And really what Paul's saying is just as a mother has no thought of personal gain in the cherishing of her child, uh, it's all for her children. So there was no thought of reward in the minds of those who were preaching there. Now he says, we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her children. What a beautiful picture that presents. Then over verse 8, uh, I want to put the word willingness. And far from Paul being there to gain for himself, what he's saying in verse 8 is this, that uh, because he was affectionately desirous of them, and not only Paul, of course, but those who were with him were affectionately desirous of them, he says, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God, 
but in fact we were willing to have imparted unto you our own soul again as a mother a mother gives herself entirely to her children and the reason why uh, Paul and Silas were like this he says because you were dear unto us the idea is this because you had come to be beloved by us this is a wonderful thing that in seven and eight what you're seeing is that Paul is able to express to them something that they knew because they'd experienced it when he was there that he truly and really loved them of course unless we love one another our ministry towards one another will not be the least bit effective if it is you know someone doesn't love you you won't be listening to them you won't be helped by them as it is that we serve the Lord how much, how important it is that we not only love the Lord's people but that we show that love so that people know that we love them this is so vitally important and so he was willing there was willingness sacrificial willingness as it is that he was amongst them in the city now over the next verse verse 9 I want to put the word hardness uh, in the sense I'm thinking that in the ministry that they were involved in in the city they had to endure hardness look at what he says uh, the Christians in Thessalonica will remember this their labor and travail so it was like this that their love for the Thessalonians determined that they did not want to be chargeable to them so they labored night and day the, the, the expression just simply means they were continually working just as he did at Corinth by the way uh, Acts chapter 18 makes that plain just as he did at Ephesus Acts chapter 20 makes that plain he labored and he traveled it's to do with the toil of his hands in order to pay his way so labor that's toil to the point of weariness travail um, some of you will know about that and the pain the painful effort that's involved in travail and so they preach with no personal benefit to themselves and they preached at great personal cost in that verse he's saying about their willingness may the lord help us to be willing like that too not to be half-hearted in the work uh, but may the lord help us that we might uh, not only be willing but endure hardness be prepared to pay the price in service for the lord at personal cost and devotion to him uh, the apostle and those who were with him labored for the lord in Thessalonica over verse 10 I'm putting the word correctness you might not think that's a very good word and I'm not sure that I do but the word correctness uh, that is to do with their behavior look at how they behaved they behave first of all holily that's not really quite the same word as holy but holily the idea is of piety is to do with an inner disposition of heart it has regard to grace it has regard to truth it has regard to God so as they were in Thessalonica they were behaving themselves holily and justly if holily was towards God then justly would be towards their fellow man they were straight and upright in the way that they dealt with them in their conduct so they would uh, no, they're witnesses and God also how holily and justly and unblameably holily towards God justly towards others unblameably in relation to ourself no charge of impropriety could be made to stick against them and what we're learning in the verse when he says you're witnesses and God also is this simple matter that when he was in the city he knew firstly that he was moving before men and secondly that he was also moving before God and both men and God could witness exactly how they behaved amongst them in that city and it was marked by rectitude correctness over verse 11 
I've put the word seriousness. And the metaphor now moves on from a nursing mother to the metaphor of a father. The father is exhorting. He's encouraging. Perhaps the children were hesitant. He's encouraging them. He's comforting them. Uh, when he was there, this was part of the ministry. He soothed them. Perhaps some were faint-hearted and they needed to be comforted. And he charged some. Uh, perhaps there were some who were wavering. But the point is this, that you'll see in that verse that the ministry in which he was engaged had solemnity about it. It was earnestness about it. As a father with his children, he greatly desired that character be produced in them, that they be living in a manner that is worthy of God, which is what exactly he says in verse 12. And over that verse, I've put the word worthiness. This was the great end that Paul had in view, that they might walk worthily of God. Elsewhere, Colossians 1, worthily of the Lord. Ephesians 4, worthily of the vocation wherewith we're called. Here it is walking worthily of God. The idea is of what is befitting, of a proper weight on the scales. And he wanted them to walk worthily of God, especially in view of this, that God had called them unto his kingdom and glory. It's a remarkable thing that God has called us unto his kingdom. And I don't doubt for a moment that this takes in the future manifested kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, which of course is the kingdom of God, mediated for God by Christ in the millennial kingdom. And he's called us unto that, to share with Christ in the administration of the universe in that day for the glory of God. So he's called us unto his kingdom and glory. And the idea is this, that the kingdom was, will be marked by the visible radiance of his presence. So Paul's recognizing that God had called them to this. And if God has called them to that, his great desire as a nursing mother and as a father would be this, that in their lives now as believers, they would walk worthily of God, whose kingdom it is. So he wasn't just counting converts. And coming away and having report meetings. No, what was happening was this. He, he, he desired that they would live worthily of the Lord. And to that end, he spent and was spent in the Lord's service for their well-being and for their profit in the manner that we have seen. So he served the Lord in a manner commensurate with the gospel. He served the Lord in love to these people and having seen them saved, saw them established and moving on for the Lord and in this remarkable expression, all in order that they might walk worthy of God. May the Lord help us to walk worthy of God and may the Lord help us in our service to him in the benefit of the benefit and interests of others be used to that end in the lives of others. Now may God bless you.